So today we're going to continue with 1 Samuel. Um, last week we went through the first, through the 15th chapter and looked at not only the life of Samuel, but uh, the beginnings of the bringing in a, a king over Israel, uh, the first king being Saul, who was chosen in many ways uh, as uh, a representation of, of man's choosing of a leader, a head above the others, you know, uh, a man that could lead them into battle is what they had asked for. There was the rejection of God as king, and the Lord told Samuel that, um, saying at Samuel's disappointment that it was not uh, him that was rejected, not Samuel that was rejected, but uh, God that they had rejected as king. So one of the things that uh, I that we had mentioned last week was that we were going to begin to see the difference between one, Israel asking for a king, coming out of this terrible period of lawlessness, really, which we saw in Judges. And we're also going to see a picture of uh, a life set apart by God, that being a king, which is very indicative of not only kingship and the culture of kingship and the culture of honor in the house of God, but also that of sonship and God's dealings with a person that is set apart in this way, which we have seen in the lives of many at this point, even up till now, Samuel. Um, and I remember early on when we started the, studying the, the, the Torah and many of the characters there, we saw how the authors are have gone into greater and greater detail in the lives of these people. We saw that with the patriarchs where, you know, with Adam and Noah and, and Abraham, we didn't see quite as much detail. And then we got very intimate by the time that we got to Isaac and Jacob specifically, who was renamed as Israel. And then we become very intimately involved in some of the details of lies. And that is even that much more true of King David. And uh, there's a lot uh, about David himself that is representative, not only in his his life, uh, the symbolism of his life, his own writings are very prophetic, and they're also in the, the prophetic nature that they have is, is messianic, which has twofold implications. One, for the life of Christ, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, Christ means Messiah, Messiah means anointed one. We will see that those words used in this book a number of times, speaking directly of the anointed one, the one set apart by God, uh, used uh, about the king. And uh, that becomes a, a theme in, in creating uh, the order and culture of God's house and revering the one that God has chosen. So, I was mentioning that it's twofold because David's life, even his writings, and so I will point to uh, something really quick that directly, one of the apostles very directly mentions this in Acts 2 or 3, Peter says this, when he is preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says, men of Israel he's talking about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave. Now, this was speaking from a, uh, a psalm of David, 
nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will, find, you will fill me with joy in your presence. So obviously David wrote these words about his own life experience and the dealings of God in his life. But they were directly prophetic in, in, in implying the very things that happen in Jesus' life as well. So Peter continues, verse 29 and next to, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb was here today. Verse 30. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. And God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to the fact he is exalted at the right hand of God. So as we look through the events of David's life, I want us to keep in mind that not only are David's words, his writings, and the events of his life, but the whole picture of David's life is a picture of the anointed one. And so I'm going to allude to that a couple of times. So the second thing before I forget to mention it, that is prophetically uh, applicable, that can be applied to our understanding of the scriptures and to the life of David and to the life of Christ, is also that it is symbolic and or representative of uh, the people of God, the sons of God. And so God's dealings with David as one who is after his own heart as one who is as a son to him and dear to him, that even David's name means beloved, loved one, near one, a dear one. So that's very closely tied to the attitude of obviously and perspective of a father to his son. And so this is something that we can use to better understand God's dealings with a son, with us as his sons. And that goes for the things that, go, that, that David goes through as a young man, uh, through the testings and the pursuance of Saul we're going to see throughout the, the rest of this particular book for Samuel. We all know, we all, many of us are familiar with the story of David and Saul's jealousy and the pursuit. And so just as we took some allegorical view and understanding uh, of the Israelites, now we see it more intimately portrayed in the individual life of David as a son of God. And so that was very much paralleled with the life of Christ, so too also with the sons of God, of whom Christ was. And David foresees those things in much of his writings. And that's why the Psalms of David in particular are well worth the time to meditate and pray and engage in because of the perspective uh, of sonship there and of God as a father and the, the way that God oversees the life of those who belong to him and are his, of his choosing as David was to him as king. There are also many other things represented, represented here uh, in relation to the plan of God and God himself as king whom... Jesus Christ was also in the line of David, in the lineage of David from the tribe of Judah. So there's a lot of things that come together here in this story. And I'm mentioning this because, again, we're not going in verse by verse. We're, we're not going to take every principle out of the life of David. Those, those I would recommend for personal study. What we're doing in this particular time uh, of Bible study is, is surveying the Bible and observing and marking out and following the thread of God's purpose throughout. But we do get a more intimate view of God's purpose in the individual life of David, and that will very much apply to our own spiritual life. So I'll bring this up again as we continue here, but we will see this difference. So we, we're talking about this life that's set apart. We're also going to see the the enmity between two ways of life, two wisdoms. Uh, that being of a former generation with Saul. How was Saul chosen as king? How, what, what was uh, admirable about this man that, that the people of Israel uh, adored him for? What was the difference with David? Look at, and we're going to observe how David was despised. And, you know, 
how those are the very things that are of a Christ-like nature that we see his own brothers despise, which also happen with Christ, which also happens spiritually with us, that there is an animosity between the wisdom of man, the ways of man, the understanding of man, the pursuits of man, the strength of man, and the ways of God, and for what is a set-apart way for his son. That takes the threat of God's purpose into the raising up and maturing and developing of a people, uh, that being the sons of God, who walk in obedience to him. And so those are things that I want to highlight early on right now, because many of these details we will kind of skim through and uh, not necessarily go into every single story, but there are a couple of things that I would like to point out because um, they have a little bit more significance in terms of David's perspective, and I want to directly correlate that uh, with the perspective of that of a son of God. And so uh, earlier I used the word again, allegory, you know, which is a, a spiritual illustrative understanding of, of actual events. So... Uh, a parable can be made out of real life situations as well, but I, I want to, to just clarify that when I use a word like parable or allegory in the context, I will do the best that I can to also qualify it as a, an actual event or not. There could be a story that was told, uh, as in maybe some of the case with Jesus parables where, you know, Jesus was not directly referring to an actual person event or otherwise. And so in our approach to scripture, I do not by any means uh, think that, that allegory is the only way to approach scripture to understand. In reality, the only way to bring true understanding and knowledge from scripture is the revelation that is given by the Spirit of God. Because anyone can pick the book up and read it, but only the Spirit of God can reveal the truth of God and the purpose of God uh, in and for his people. Through it. Otherwise, it just becomes a jumbled mess. So when I use allegory here, I do want to go ahead and qualify this saying, David was a real person. These were real events, historical, actual things that happened, and not just symbolic examples. However, we would, it, 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 it would, we would lose a lot if we were, did not take the symbolic spiritual application and apply it to our life as sons of God looking to grow, mature, in our wisdom and understanding in the house of the Lord. And so, you know, the light, that's the amazing thing about the wisdom and the knowledge of God is that it is both the real event that happened here in this purpose, person's life, but God ordained that that person's life was to represent something else, not only for himself in the spirit then, but also for those who were to come. And that's some of exactly what Peter was referring to when he was sharing the gospel there in Acts. So we had gone through up to chapter 15 and seen that uh, Saul was actually rejected by God as king. <clears throat> Again, this very different way of understanding and practicing and putting into practice the ways of God. That kind of ended with an example of Saul disobeying uh, the, the, the word of the Lord through Samuel uh, but but still pr like doing all the functions. So, oh, I did what God wanted to do. And Samuel sees that Saul did that and he's, he marks it out very differently. And he says, but you didn't do it in the way that God. And so that, that was a marked difference between the heart of Saul and the heart of David. David made mistakes. He made sins. We're going to see that uh, in 2 Samuel and, and some of the other uh, continuing uh, writings. Uh, but David's way of understanding and receiving the things of the Lord was very different than what, what Saul did. And we're going to see that early on in his life. So that's where in chapter 15, where we ended last week, Samuel's response to Saul saying, well, I did everything that you told me. And Samuel's direct indication is you didn't do it in the way 
It wasn't that you did this sacrifice or that you went through this religious motion. So he says the all familiar scriptures, which are in uh, 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 22 through 23. He says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? So the revelation of the word of the Lord, and that means in his way. So he says to, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, to let it be fully applied and worked out in your life is better than the fat of rams. So he counted what Saul did, though he went through the motions, as rebellion. For rebellion is like the sin of div divination and arrogance, presumption, like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. The word of God, okay? The word of God, let's just stay on that for a moment. Contemporary Christianity sees the word of God as the, the black and white and red letters that are printed in between and on the pages of a book called the Holy Bible. That's the word of God. But let's understand that the word of God is the expressed will of God and that the word of God is a power that is able to accomplish what it is set out to do. So, if it is the expressed will of God, then it it's directly correlated with the way that God intends to fulfill his will. God has not just simply a desire to see something happen. He has a way that he intends for it to be worked out. And that's directly connected with the expression of his will, which is his word which God chose from the very beginning for that to be expressed through and in the life of a man, a lowly being made of the dust of the earth into which he breathed his life. Now, these are all lessons that God was revealing and teaching to the Israelites up until this point. Now we're seeing worked out in individual lives. But we see that the word of God directly correlates with the will of God and the understanding and the working out of that can only be accomplished through the power of the Spirit to learn and to put into practice the ways and the wisdom of God. That applies to the Word of God that is given to us in the law of God, the Torah, that which will enable us to hit the mark. It's teaching in instruction to shoot the arrow so as to hit the mark. The mark is what? What's the target? What are we shooting at? To become like God as his sons. To be able to take on and grow in and be taught of his character, his nature. The target is what is God's purpose. So we can't hit the bullseye if we don't know what the purpose and plan of God is. And even in that case, it may be that we have, or someone may have some understanding of what the purpose and will of God is, but chooses their own way to see it fulfilled. And we've seen up to this point many times, God will have things done in his way because they are perfect and holy, not just because he's selfish and demands it. <laughs> There's a reason behind it. And that reason is always connected to his character and his nature. So let's move into chapter 16. We're going to now see... When David is anointed as a young boy, he is anointed as king of Israel. And we'll point out one specific 
part here because we know some of the story here. And so uh, let's take a look here. So uh, Samuel goes to anoint David. He fears initially that Saul would want to kill him for doing so because obviously there have been some things that have changed in Saul. He's been rejected as king. The Lord said, I specifically will have someone who is after my own heart. So he goes to Jesse, he's sent to Jesse to make a sacrifice there. And then on verse 7, he comes to the house, he sees Jesse's firstborn, and, and Samuel says, well, surely this is the, the Lord's anointed. But the Lord, verse 7, said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Remember, Saul was a, a man who stood ahead above everyone else. For I have rejected him. I have not chosen him to be king. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. He's not, he doesn't care about the interests of men that are short-sighted and selfish. You see, we're building a context historically, scripturally, for what is it that God wants? What is it that God desires? We just saw in the previous chapter, does the Lord delight in, is that what he wants? Is that what he delights in? What does God desire from man? So again, we have a reference to that. The Lord does not look on the things that man looks like. Looks like. He doesn't count important what man sees as important and valuable. Now, when we see something like that, we should say, well, then what does he look like? What does he look at? What is he looking for? What is it that God requires? What is it that God desires of man? Well, he also just said in, in the last time we looked at that, that God is saying, I am looking for a man who is after my own heart. So here he follows saying, man looks on the appearance, outward appearance. That's not just physical, physical appearance and physique. It is what is assumed by it. That's a good looking, strong, tall man. Therefore, he could do this and do that. For my interest, for my desire. But God is looking at what he is wanting to accomplish in the midst of man and saying, here, verse 7, the Lord looks at the heart, the inner man, the inner life, the ways of man, the desires, the motives, the interests. Now, who was David? He passes the younger sons in front of Samuel. But Samuel says, well, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. Are this all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. But he is tending the sheep. This comes up. As a, this is referred to several times and many times throughout uh, the story of David's life that he is a shepherd, that he was a shepherd. There's a, there's a, a different perspective and heart and a care and concern that a shepherd has because of his care and love for the sheep. Now that example, that of a shepherd, is taken all throughout the New Testament as well. So there's something very, very important that's represented here by the position, the care, the perspective of the shepherd. Remember that Jesus said specifically to Peter when he's asked, do you love me? 
Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep, care for my sheep, tend to my sheep. And what does a shepherd do? Watches over the flock, leads them to pasture, to gentle stream, protects them from praying animals. So they are those who lead, instruct, and guide others. But here we see, but he's just doing this, and we're going to see that referred to by his brother as well in, not, in just a close, close time here. So he comes in, Samuel immediately has him kneel down, because the Lord says, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel went to Ramah. Another interesting thing happens uh, that is explained in this chapter is that the spirit of the Lord left Saul and it was replaced by an evil spirit sent from God to torment him. So David comes and he plays for Saul to quiet the spirit. David was a, a harpist and a singer, obviously a songwriter and psalmist as well. We can see that there are many psalms that he had. One last reference to uh, verse 14, uh, 13 there and 14 in chapter 16. We see that the Spirit comes upon David and will begin to train David here. You know, David was a young boy and it would be almost 40 years until he became king of Israel, but he was anointed as king of Israel now. So I want to refer to what I had mentioned earlier about keeping an observation, an attentive perspective on the life of David and how he was raised up and trained by God to be his anointed one as a direct parallel to the discipline and the discipling of God and of the Spirit to be raised up as a son of God. Chapter 17 is the all-familiar story of David and Goliath. Um, some interesting aspects here, you know, in relation to Goliath the giant. You know, the Israel was sent into the land of the giants. We had looked at the, the spiritual parallel of not only the peoples in the land, but the giants in the land, which are not just big people, they were spiritual entities. And so this is very representative of that spiritual entity, and I want to point out a couple of things that give us that direct indication. So Goliath was a, a, a champion. He was a, a warrior from a young boy trained for fighting in battle, and he obviously grew to be a giant of a man, over nine feet tall. If you look at some measurements and imagine somebody being that large, uh, it's pretty intimidating. They said that his armor was made out of like a thick metal, like bronze, that his armor weighed like 125 pounds. That's what he carried on his body and moved around in. And his, uh, like even the head of his spear alone was 15 pounds. Nonetheless, nonetheless the, the beam that the spearhead sat on. So he wasn't just a really tall, lanky guy who could barely manage his way around. This was a big, strong warrior. And I, I take the time to, to, to mention some of that because the as a spiritual entity that causes fear and dismay, that's why I'm telling you there's a, there's a spirit behind this. Look at verse 10 and 11. When Goliath comes out and he defies Israel, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, 
See, there's a word that's spoken, a voice, a declaration. Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's a spirit. So again, this is a historical event. There was a real giant. David was a real person. He really fought him. But there's a spiritual representation here of what comes against the sons of God, the people of God, and how they are to be handled and dealt with. So this is one slight deviation, like not deviation, but just side subject that I, I wanted to point out because we will all face these these kinds of spirits that cause fear and dismay. So David obviously comes to visit. He is immediately put off by what is is said by uh, Goliath, and that's referred to in verse 23 that, again, we also see that there was a timing here that he had been coming out for 40 days to do this, so this was a time of testing for the leader of Israel, Saul, and for the Israelites, the, the Israelite army. The number 40 is ind indicative of that. And, but David comes at this point and says he heard the defiant shout of Goliath, and then he began to uh, ask about him. And so he starts to ask, well, what will be done for this? And then ultimately he says, well, you know, hey, you guys don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of this guy. Now, previous to that, one of his oldest brother, Eliab, had seen or heard, seen and heard David go around and ask, and he becomes very jealous. Here we have another mentioning of uh, this, I don't know if I would say spirit, but the, the way of thinking and understanding and perspective that despises the the way of God. So verse 28, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with all the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the desert? Aren't you supposed to be doing your little lowly job of caring for sheep? He continues, I know how conceited you are and, you're how, and how wicked your heart is, which is actually the very opposite of the truth. You only came down to watch the, the battle. So you can see that, that David's lowly position as a shepherd and caring for the sheep is despised, and it's meant to be some kind of insult. But interestingly, what unfolds in this story, as David comes and he says, well, I'll fight this guy. <laughs> so d d in verse 32, he goes to Saul, or he's taken to Saul, and he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So Saul's like, well, you can't do that. You're just a boy. David then basically takes what was just mentioned by Eliab, taking care of these few sheep, and he shows and, and, and describes, explains specifically how God used that time as a training time for him, giving him the faith and confidence to be able to come against this man. So he, he explains that starting in verse 34. He says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, there's a, there's a reference to a spirit here as well, the same kind of the spirit that is carried with this man, Goliath, the giant. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. What does hand mean here? It means from the strength, the power. So the, the, the word hand actually, it means strength and power. It also has 
Another meaning it means the, the axle, the turning, what causes the turning of a wheel. So there's a way indicated here. The way, the wisdom of the strength of man. And he says, God is bigger than this. He's going to explain this in more detail to Goliath himself. But there's another way. And this is showing you how David thinks, what his perspective is of his own life and of the ways of God. He will deliver me from that way, from that power. And from this stranger, this sojourner, which is what Philistine means. So Saul says, here, put on this armor. We have, I know I'm sending a lot of detail here, but we have so many little comparisons of the way that people think. So Saul says, well, you're going to need armor to go fight. He puts on this armor and like David says, I can't move with all this on. It's the wrong covering. It's the wrong armor. It will inhibit me. So again, a juxtaposition between two ways of thinking, not just a battle, but in how we go about doing what we do. David was on mission from the Lord here by the leading of the Spirit. Saul was still seeing things as man sees things. So David chooses not to wear the armor. He goes armed with only his uh, staff and, and a sling. And we know that Goliath, we know the story, but we're going to touch a couple of details still. Verse 42 says this. He sees that David was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him, showing contempt, worthless. He sees a young boy come out against him, and he says, is this some sort of a joke? The difference between the way of God, the power of God, and the understanding and the wisdom of man. So he says, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to give your flesh to the birds. And David responds here, and I want to read this. Verse 45 of chapter 17. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. Interestingly, all weapons that are held by the hand, by the strength of man. But I come to you against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. So he didn't say, I'm coming to you in the name of Israel and our army because our army is better than yours and we'll defeat you. He didn't even say, I'm coming against you with this weapon. What was the weapon that is mentioned by David here? It is the purpose, the plan, and the intention of God. That is what you are defying. You are defying the purpose of God that is being fulfilled in and through his people and even in my own life. You are showing reproach to the purpose and the plan and the intention of God, which cannot be changed. That's David's perspective. Oh, by the way, that God and his purpose and his plan and his intentions are being met out through this people. And so it is you, now it's interesting, Goliath says, all right, little boy, I'm going to smash you and feed your flesh to the birds. You, David. David says, I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head, and I'm going to feed the flesh of the entire Philistine army to the birds. <laughs> and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. This will be a proclamation of the purpose of God in and through his people and his anointed one to the world. 
and all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear the strength of the hand of man that the Lord saves. That is not how God fulfills his purposes. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. So we know that David defeats Goliath, cuts his hat off, keeps his sword. The Israelites pursue the Philistines and overcome them in that day. It was a great victory. A lot of lessons there spiritually, in perspective, by principle of how God does things, not according to the ways of man. Right from the, the point of David's anointing, God clearly says, it's not the outside that I'm looking at, it's what's in the heart, it's the perspective, the way, the wisdom that you live your life in and with and through. And David directly applies that here. Something else that we're going to see David do many times is inquire of the Lord before he goes to do what he does. Saul, on the other hand, was told to inquire of the Lord, wait on the Lord, but he refused to do it. He just said, well, here's what God wants me to do, so I'll do that. But he didn't wait on the Lord and was therefore not obedient to the Lord. David, on the other hand, even when the odds seem impossible, would ask of the Lord and do what the Lord said. So now there's a relational change between Saul and David. Initially, it was all great to have him come into his home and play music and settle this, this tormenting spirit. Then he became a champion and defeated the Philistines, which was great until the people shouted, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Verse 9 of chapter 18 says, And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So now we're going to see unfolding this, this, uh, this animosity between the understanding, the perspective, the way of life of Saul, what is represented through his life, and that of David as the beloved of God. Two very different men in their heart and in their perspective, and you will see what was represented here, again, the enmity between the spirit and the flesh, and the ways of the spirit and the ways of the flesh. We also see here in chapter 18 that Jonathan and David become very close. They, they make covenants with one another. And the persecution of David... Or that which comes against the spirit of sonship in the house of God. So a different way, again, a different way or wisdom. Uh, that is not the way of man, but it persecutes the way of God. So Saul begins to pursue David. So Saul had become disobedient, lawless in many ways, seeking to overtake and rule over or destroy David. Also, we see that this force against the wisdom and way of God being produced in us. It also says in verse 12 that Saul became fearful of David because he knew that the Lord was with him. That's mentioned in verse 12, verse 15, and also in verse 28. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because of the Lord was with David, but he had left Saul. Verse 28, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul was even more afraid of him and remained his enemy for the rest of his days. He also tried to give his wife Michael, or Michal, I don't know how to say her name, says he was given as a snare to David, which ultimately she did become. So 19 and 20 
The next few chapters, God or Saul continues to pursue David. David uh, and Jonathan covenant again. Initially, Jonathan says, "No, my father would never do that." And Jonathan or David says, "He absolutely will do that." And then in verse 16 of chapter 20, we see what would be very uh, much a prophetic uh, oath that Jonathan makes a covenant with David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. So that is something that was also uh, said of the Messiah. Uh, and even all the way back to Abraham. And when the Lord said, Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Speaking directly of the people of God. So David goes through many things here. Again, we're not going to detail all of this. There are some interesting points in terms of the dynamics of the relationship between Saul, David, and Jonathan. First, uh, chapter 21, David goes to the priests at Nob. Uh, so David is, is basically in exile in the kingdom of Saul. You can imagine what is going through his heart and his mind, knowing that he was anointed as king of Israel, but being completely rejected by the leadership that are there. So there's also going on in the midst of this uh, a, a development of his own heart and character of who he would become as the king of Israel. You know, David was the king of Israel. He was known as the king who had a whole heart for God as the one who brought peace to Israel, as the one who had developed the plans and had a great desire for the building of God's house. This is, these are things that we're going to see as we go into 2 Samuel. So some highlights of things that happen. He flees to the priests of Nob. Uh, they were uh, uh, ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean, and they were uh, given the showbread or the consecrated bread because of uh, David's way of doing things kept him with clean hands and a pure heart. So Saul continues to pursue him everywhere he goes. At one point he finds where he's at and then gets called back because of war. And then we know that there are two instances where uh, while uh, Saul was uh, uh, excuse me, pursuing David, that um, David could have killed him. One was in the cave, and the other was when David breaks into the camp and takes the spear that was in the ground right by Saul's head. And now his men said, well, this is what God has given you this opportunity to kill Saul. And the Lord, there's something indicative here about the culture of kingship in the house of God that is directly mentioned because David says it, it's a, there's a culture of honor here um, specifically honoring God and the things of God and his ways and his anointed one that David mentions twice in these event, in these two separate events saying, you know, God forbid that I lay a hand on the anointed one. God will finish what he was doing in the way that he chooses. So not only did David apply that to his own life, he also, in, in this instant when he's being pursued by someone who would kill him, he would dare not touch the Lord's anointed. And so, you know, David uh, is showing the heart of God and the heart of Christ as represented here. Um, one example of, I mentioned before, David inquiring before the Lord, we see in verse 2 of chapter 23. Uh, so the, fight, the Philistines were fighting, and uh, he goes to save the city of uh, Keilah. But first, verse 2 says, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack the Philistines? And the Lord says, go, you, they'll do it. And even David's men said, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot more of them than there are of us. We're not going to win this battle. So verse 4, once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, go down to Kilia, for I'm going to give the Philistines in your hand. So David and his men went. So he, he did things by obedience, by faith and obedience. Uh, which which go directly together, faith with practice, um, and that's not just. I want to uh, just mention this as a, as an application for us that faith and practice is not just going to do the impossible; it's putting into practice the truth and the revelation of God. And so here in this instance, it is that 
you know, God says, should I do this? Or David says, should I do this? The odds don't seem that great. <laughs> I don't know that he said that, but obviously he said, as long as, as long as the Lord says I can do this, then I know that it can be done. So we, that see, we see this, the same kind of faith that Caleb had and Joshua rising up again here in David. So, uh, you know, there's a, a little intermediary store here, story here. We see David spares Saul's life, and then David and his men are, they're just wandering out there. He has a bunch of misfits with him, those who were uh, disenchanted from uh, the kingdom, and or they were, some of them were criminals, and, you know, uh, many, uh, they were kind of an unsultry crowd. And so they're moving around, they're taking provisions, uh, they're with the Philistines, and then they're kind of on their own, they're back and forth, and we have this story in the middle where David uh, takes on his wife Abigail, who was formerly the wife of Nabal, Nabal. So David and his men stayed in a particular area for a while, protected this man's sheep. He's a very wealthy man, had a lot of land, a lot of servants, a lot of sheep. And he basically comes to him and says, you know, can you offer me some provision? And he says, well, who are you? Why should I give you anything? Which was really the wrong response because David got a little bit upset and said, okay, we're going to go kill this guy and all of his sons. Uh, but Abigail hears of that, and she comes out with uh, an offering to him. And, uh, you know, David blesses her for being wise in this way. Uh, it says that Nabal was a very wicked man. He died basically of a heart attack after he found out what David was going to do. So the Lord took his life. And then uh, Abigail, in verse 32, um, gives this, this praise over to God over the life of David, which again has a, a very spiritual symbolism, uh, even a prophetic symbolism to Christ and the people of God. So then he takes Abigail of his wife. In chapter 26, we see that, <coughs> excuse me, David again spares Saul's life. And they're in the midst of the camp. And Abishai in verse 8 of 26 says, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now we're going to see this applied very quickly in the next, in the first chapter of 1 Samuel when after Saul is put to death, you know, a, a young man comes and says, "What?" you know, David asks what happened, and he hears that Jonathan and Saul were killed, and then he's like, well, how did Saul die? And this guy says what happened. Anyway, you're going to see that when you read that. I won't give it away. It's kind of an interesting perspective here because it directly relates to, to what David says here. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Surely as the Lord lives... He said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head. So he takes that, then he calls out to uh, Abner, who was with Saul, and basically says, you haven't done your job. You haven't protected the Lord's anointed and you should be put to death for it. And finally, Saul relents. Verse 21, I've sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you have considered my life precious today and I will not try to harm you again. And I've acted like a fool and erred greatly. And uh, anyway, the, the, obviously what David was paying attention to and caring for was not Saul's life so much as it was that he was the anointed one of God. And so... David again goes out among the Philistines and uh, then Saul has this uh, word that comes against him um, before he goes to the, the Philistines and he's, he conjures up through divination the spirit of Samuel and then Samuel does nothing but reaffirm what he has said before. So in chapter 28, verse 16, it says this, Samuel says, why did you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he has predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Why? And this is where we always want to pay attention is to why 
is God doing what he's doing in the way that he's doing? it? Verse 18, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath, fierce wrath against the Am Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow <coughs> you and your sons will be with me in the place of death. The Lord will also hand over the army of the Philistines. So let's just dissect that a little bit. Because you did not obey, verse 18, the Lord or carry out his fierce anger and wrath. So he did fight the Amalekites. He did defeat the Amalekites. So what was wrong here? It was that he didn't do it in the way that God had said. So we need to be careful in our own lives that we don't just do things out of an obligation, the motions of fulfillment, but that we, obedience is not just doing something, it's the way that you do it, the heart attitude that you do it with, the perspective that you have when you do it. Now that is a fearful thing for me to think about because man, God's looking a lot more deeper than whether I just did something or not. He wants to know why you did it, what attitude you did it, what was your perspective when you do it? What were the motives of your heart? Just to be able to say that you've done it? Or are you looking at my ways, my perspective? That's what Samuel says here. You rejected the ways of God. So David again goes back to Ziklag. Interestingly, he ends up in Gath. I find it very interesting that he stayed in these areas of the Philistines that were from the same area of the, the army that he had, you know, that the Israelites had completely destroyed and from where Goliath came. David comes, verse chapter 30, we can see the headlines there. David destroys the Amalekites and he takes back... Uh, He takes Ziklag, and then uh, he destroys the Amalekites, who Samuel had just said, this is what you didn't do, now David fulfills it. And then we also see the mentioning of, of Caleb here in chapter 30, um, verse 13. In 14, he said, I am, because he was talking to this man who came from the battle. My master abandoned me when I came ill three years ago. 14, we raided the negative of the Carathites and the territory belonging to Judah and negative, negative Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. So David goes and he takes all of that back from the Amalekites. And then he displays much of his kingly character in that there were those who stayed behind and then after they defeated them and came back, then his own men kind of uh, argued about who should get what shares. And in verse Dave, uh, 23, David says, No, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed over to us the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is the same of that whom who went down to battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to is to this. So we see this direct display of a, a kingly de, a character uh, that has been developed in, da in David. We will end today just knowing that in the, the last part here is where Saul uh, goes into battle and is surrounded. He uh, is mortally wounded and uh, then asks his armor bearer to run him through who refuses to do so. So uh, Saul takes his own sword and falls on it uh, to his own death. Um, and then news of this is going to come back to David um, as we move into 2 Samuel. So let's go ahead and for next week, uh, be, be prepared and read through uh, 2 Samuel. Uh,
let's go ahead and read, uh, you know, again, the first 12 to 15 chapters. And then we will work our way uh, through that section of the scriptures next week. We will finish there today.